Hello and welcome to our podcast on motifs in film. This is another podcast in our series on storytelling and plot in Hollywood. Basically, we're looking at the literary level of film. These are the things that film has in common with literature. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. So as always, we like to talk about what exactly the literary term is. So what is a motif? A motif is an item that repeats multiple times throughout a text. And so just like any of these terms that we're talking about, while we are focusing on them at the film level, these are definitely true of any piece of literature that we might be reading as well. So what is that item that repeats? That item could be an actual item, a physical item, a thing, an object, a shell, a book, an airplane, something tangible. But a motif could also be something like a recurring color, a recurring action, perhaps even a line of dialogue, a recurring character, or most specifically to film class, it could also be a recurring musical theme, something we have in film, but we don't have in literature. And the point of all of this is that as the motif repeats, it helps to reveal the theme or the message and lesson of that text. So why are motifs important? Well, like we mentioned, the recurrence of a motif can help reveal the theme or the lesson of that text. These reoccurring elements help advance the plot. They're kind of like something that is woven in between the plot. And the motifs begin to matter when we look at the change in them throughout a text. And so how do we find motifs? One is we have to be active viewers of film. We have to look for recurring patterns. We have to look for those items that we've seen before or colors or actions or lines of dialogue. If we're not paying attention and viewing actively, and instead we're just kind of hanging out waiting for the movie to explain itself at the end, then we're not going to see any of these patterns. So we need to make a commitment to view the film actively. As we do that, we need to look for variations. How does the motif start at the beginning of this film? And then by 90 minutes or 120 minutes in, how has that motif changed? How has its context changed, become different, more or less impactful? That kind of stuff. We need to be able to track that pattern. Where does that motif seem to occur? What is the context of its occurrence? And so if we are actively viewing these films, we can notice and track and observe the pattern to begin with and then be looking for any variations that might be happening. So here's what we mean by a variation in a motif. In Harry Potter 3, The Prisoner of Azkaban, there's a great motif of a dog. In that film, we see multiple instances where a dog or some sort of relationship to a dog becomes very important to the plot. At the very beginning, when Dudley's aunt is visiting, she gets very upset about people who are stupid. And she says, you know what? It's the parents' fault. It's just like raising dogs. If there's something wrong with the female dog, then there's going to be something wrong with the child. And so she starts this motif of dog. At first, we're like, well, what is she talking about? What a crazy metaphor to use. But then a couple scenes later, Harry runs away from that house. He's had enough. He's leaving. And as he's sitting in the park, the clouds roll in, the weather changes, and this dark dog comes out of the bushes and seems to kind of stalk him. A few scenes later, when Harry is back at Hogwarts, he goes to divination class, and they're being asked to examine the tea leaf remnants in their class with Professor Trelawney. And as he is examining his own tea leaf scenario, when he gets to examine his, it seems like his tea leaves are in the shape of a dog, an ominous shape in the wizarding world. And then a few scenes later, when Harry is playing Quidditch, he's chasing the snitch up and up and up into the thunderously dark sky. All of a sudden, the Dementors are all around him. And as he looks into the clouds, one of the clouds seems to be shaped, again, like a dog. Toward the end, as the kids are exploring the Whomping Willow area, as they're chasing after Ron's lost rat, there seems to be a dog that's right there. And he grabs Ron's leg and drags him under the Whomping Willow. And then the final variation we notice is not the dog itself, but we see just dog footprints. And so here, the kids are inside the Shrieking Shack, after they have finally found Ron, after he's been dragged through this tunnel from the Whomping Willow to the Shrieking Shack. And again, we don't see the dog, we don't see the dog's face, but we just see footprints of a dog. 
And so that is the example of a motif of dog, but how it is shown in great variation. It could be a word, then an image, then a hint, then a flavor of something, and then perhaps just another mention of it. And then in Harry Potter, not to give anything away, but spoiler alert, the movie's been out for a while, so I'm gonna go ahead and ruin it. That dog is important, and the motif of the dog becomes exceptionally important because Sirius Black, Harry's godfather, who has been kind of trying to keep an eye out on Harry and try to make contact with him, is an animagus. He is able to change his form from that of a human to that of a dog. If we had been paying attention to the variations of the motif throughout the text, we would be able to understand or predict, perhaps, that the dog is exceptionally important. And then as we see here in the end, the dog is important because it's not just about a dog. It's about revealing the character of Sirius Black, of connecting him to Harry Potter, that he is actually a good character out to help Harry Potter, not to kill him like we have thought previously throughout the entire movie. And so as we're paying attention to these motifs, we're viewing actively, we're writing down instances where we see a repeated pattern. By the end of the film, we have to look at that pattern and we have to do some thinking. We have to ask ourselves, how does the pattern change from the beginning of the text to the end of the text? And that change is what matters. Why does the meaning change? How does the meaning change? That change is what reveals the theme. And so if we can track the motif of the dog in Harry Potter 3, we can see that it starts off as something very derogatory, where the ant is making fun of somebody and calling them horrible names about female dogs. But by the end, the dog has become a symbol of protection, a symbol of goodness in Harry's life. And so ultimately, we are supposed to learn a positive message through the evolution of the motif of dog. So here are some examples of different structures that motifs can take. So like we mentioned, one motif structure can be that of a physical item. And here's an example from the James Bond film Skyfall. We see on M's desk, she has a ceramic bulldog with a British flag across its back. At the very first instance, it's a very quick reveal. We barely even notice it on the corner of her desk. But as we go through the film, we see it a little bit more prominently displayed on a different desk. And then ultimately, by the end of the film, when M has passed away, James Bond receives that same ceramic bulldog as a gift from her that she had given to him in her will. So again, we need to go through the steps. Number one, view actively. Look for patterns. And once we start to see that this dog is going to come back over and over again, we have to write down the instances of when we see it coming back. And then ultimately, we have to ask ourselves, how does its meaning change by the end? And perhaps through that change, we can learn the lesson or the theme of this film. Here's another example of an item as a motif. This comes from the film Inception. And in this movie, the motif is a picture frame. And it is a picture of the young boy, his father, and the young boy playing with a pinwheel. And the first couple instances, we see this motif as the picture in the frame. Later, we see just kind of a curled up old ratty photo that comes out of a character's wallet. The third time, same thing. We see that old ratty picture coming out of this guy's wallet. And then finally, by the end, we see the actual pinwheel coming out of a very important scene. The item is the motif, a physical item, a photo, of picture, and then of the pinwheel itself. And so if we're paying attention, we can track its change, and with a little bit of deep thinking, we can figure out what the author is trying to say through that change of that motif. We can also have recurring colors as motifs. An example here is from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now the film is in color, it's not that old, but most of the color palette is kind of dark, sandy, Middle Eastern lands, lots of golds, grays, tans, things like that. But every once in a while, the color red shows up. And again, this is one of those where variation is important. For example, in the upper left, we might see the color red in the Life magazine title. But then in the upper right, we might see red in terms of Marion's pants. We then might see red again on the sash of the guy with the gigantic sword who's trying to kill Indy. And then finally in the bottom right, we might see red in the bottle of poison. 
that some shady character spreads all over the dates that end up killing the monkey. The point is we can have a recurring color also serving as a motif. We mentioned before that we can have an action as a motif. And I think one of the best examples of this and one of the most obvious is from the Lego movie. That throughout the movie, Emmett, our main character, continues to try to reach out and hold hands with Wildstyle, the girl that he meets on his journey. And throughout the entirety of the movie, these two characters try to hold hands, or he tries to hold hands with her. And they get very, very close. They can almost reach out, and Emmett can almost touch her. But every single time, they are thwarted by something, and they never get to hold hands. Finally, by the end of the film, Emmett and Wildstyle are able to hold hands and begin their new relationship together. And so it is an action that is repeated, the idea of reaching out and holding hands. Another example of a motif could be in dialogue. And so here we have an example of dialogue as a motif from the movie Pitch Perfect. Every time that the Bard and Bellas go out on stage for a competition, they do this little thing where they group up, they put their hands in, kind of like some sort of a sports huddle, they count off to three, and then they sing a note. Hands in! One, two, four! And since we see that over and over again before all of their performances and competitions, it becomes a motif, a very simple one note that they're trying to sing. So it's kind of dialogue, but in effect it is a motif. And so again, our job is to notice the repetition, notice that they keep repeating this huddle thing before any performance, to track how it goes. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it does not go well and it falls apart. And then ultimately, how does that motif change by the end? And so if we're viewing actively, we can also see how this dialogue serves as a motif. Another example of an item that can serve as a motif is a character itself. And so in the film The Proposal, we have the minor character of Ramon serving as a motif. This character seems to be everywhere. He starts the film as a waiter at a small gathering where he is serving food. A couple scenes later, we see him as the only exotic dancer on this small island off the coast of Alaska. A few scenes later, he's the employee at the general store where everybody buys all of their goods in this tiny little town. And then ultimately, we see Ramon performing the wedding ceremony at the end of the film. So Ramon himself doesn't change. He is a static, minor character. He doesn't necessarily advance the plot because the plot was going to go on whether he was there or not. But since he is woven into so many scenes and we see him over and over again, he ends up serving as a motif. And then the last idea of a motif is the kind of motif you can only see in film or perhaps live theater, where we have the addition of a soundtrack to a text. We can have a musical theme as a motif. And so in specific, we have the example from Slumdog Millionaire, where the love interest or the double goal of the main character is a girl named Latika. And every time that Latika is thought about, or mentioned, or seen on screen, the same musical sound comes out on the soundtrack. So in summary, motifs are recurring patterns in films and in literature. There could definitely be variation in the motif. It doesn't have to be the same exact color every time. It doesn't have to be the same exact shape every time. The point is just that an idea a color, a piece of dialogue, a musical sound is being repeated in a similar context over and over throughout a text. And then again, the steps are we need to pay attention by viewing actively. We need to track and write down these instances. And then we need to look for change in that motif from beginning to end. And then apply some deep thinking. What does that change reveal to us in terms of the motif? I think that's about it for now. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions on motifs in film, please go ahead and bring those in. We'll answer those up and we'll go from there. Thanks a lot.